Section 9 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Maddock. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anne Catherine Green. Section 9. Problem 6. The House of Clocks, Part 2 Another day passed, and she had not yet seen Miss Postlewaite. She was hoping each hour to be sent on some errand to that young lady's room, but no such opportunity was granted her. Once she ventured to ask the doctor, whose visits were now very frequent, what he thought of the young lady's condition. But as this question was necessarily put in Mrs. Postlewaite's presence, the answer was naturally guarded and possibly not altogether frank. "'Our young lady is weaker,' he acknowledged. "'Much weaker,' he added, with marked emphasis and his most professional air. "'Or she would be here instead of in her own room.' It grieves her not to be able to wait upon her generous benefactress. The word fell heavily. Had it been used as a test? Violet gave him a look, though she had much rather have turned her discriminating eye upon the face staring up at them from the pillow. Had the alarm expressed by others communicated itself at last to the physician? Was the charm which had held him subservient to the mother dissolving under the pitiable state of the child, and was he trying to aid the little detective nurse in her effort to sound the mystery of her condition? His look expressed benevolence, but he took care not to meet the gaze of the woman he had just lauded, possibly because that gaze was fixed upon him in a way to tax his moral courage. The silence which ensued was broken by Mrs. Postlewaite. "'She will live, this poor Helena,' "'How long?' she asked with no break in her voice's wanton music. The doctor hesitated. Then, with a candor hardly to be expected from him, answered, "'I do not understand Miss Postlewaite's case. I should like, with your permission, to consult some New York physician.' "'Indeed!' a single word. But as it left this woman's thin lips, Violet recoiled, and perhaps the doctor did. Rage can speak in one word as well as in a dozen, and the rage which spoke in this one was of no common order, though it was quickly suppressed, as was all other show of feelings when she added, with a touch of her old charm, "'Of course you will do what you think is best. As you know, I never interfere with a doctor's decisions. But—' and here her natural ascendancy of tone and manner returned in all its potency. It would kill me to know that a stranger was approaching Helena's bedside. It would kill her. She's too sensitive to survive such a shock. Violet recalled the words worked with so much care by this young girl on a minute piece of linen. I do not want to die and watched the doctor's face for some sign of resolution. But embarrassment was all she saw there, and all she heard him say was the conventional reply. "'I'm doing all I can for her. We will wait another day and note the effect of my latest prescription.' "'Another day?' The deathly calm which overspread Mrs. Postlewaite's features as the word left the physician's lips warned Violet not to let another day go by without some action. But she made no remark, and, indeed, betrayed but little interest in anything beyond her own patient's condition. That seemed to occupy her wholly. With consummate art she gave the appearance of being under Mrs. Postlewaite's complete thrall, and watched with fascinated eyes every movement of the one unstricken finger which could do so much. This little detective of ours could be an excellent actor when she chose to make the old man speak, to force this conscience-stricken but rebellious soul to reveal what the clock forbade. How could it be done? 
This continued to be Violet's great problem. She pondered it so deeply during all the remainder of the day that a little pucker settled in her brow, which someone, I will not mention who, would have been pained to see. Mrs. Postlewaite, if she noticed it at all, probably ascribed it to her anxieties as nurse, for never had Violet been more assiduous in her attention. But Mrs. Postlewaite was no longer the woman she had been, and possibly never noted it at all. At five o'clock, Violet suddenly left the room. Slipping down into the lower hall, she went the round of the clocks herself, listening to every one. There was no perceptible difference in their tick. Satisfied of this, and that it was simply the old man's imagination which had supplied them each with a separate speech, she paused before the huge one at the foot of the stairs, the one whose dictate he had promised himself to follow, and with an eye upon its broad, staring dial, muttered wistfully, Oh, for an idea! For an idea! Did this cumbrous relic of old-time precision turn traitor at this ingenuous plea? The dial continued to stare, the works to sing, but Violet's face suddenly lost its perplexity. With a wry look about her and a listening ear turned toward the stair top, she stretched out her hand and pulled open the door, guarding the pendulum, and peered in at the works. Smiling slyly to herself as she pushed it back into place and retreated up the stairs to the sick room. When the doctor came that night, she had a quiet word with him outside Mrs. Postlewaite's door. Was that why he was on hand when old Mr. Dunbar stole from his room to make his nightly circuit of the halls below? Something quite beyond the ordinary was in the good physician's mind. For the look he cast at the old man was quite unlike any he had ever bestowed upon him before, and when he spoke, it was to say with marked urgency, "'Our beautiful young lady will not live a week unless I get at the seat of her malady. Pray that I may be enabled to do so, Mr. Dunbar.' A blow to the aged man's heart, which called forth a feeble, "'Yes, yes,' followed by a wild stare, which imprinted itself upon the doctor's memory at the look of one hopelessly old, who hears for the first time a distinct call from the grave, which has been long awaiting him. A solitary lamp stood at the lower hall. As the old man picked his slow way down, its small, hesitating flame flared up as in a sudden gust, then sank down, flickering and fainting, as if it, too, had heard a call which summoned it to extinction. No other sign of life was visible anywhere. Sunk in twilight shadows, the corridors branched away on either side, no place in particular, and serving to all appearances, as many must have thought in days gone by, as mere hiding places for clocks. To listen to their united hum, the old man paused, looking at first a little distraught, but settling at last into his usual self as he started forward upon his course. Did some whisper hitherto unheard warn him that it was the last time he would tread the weary round? Who can tell? He was trembling very much with his task nearly completed. He stepped out again into the main hall and crept rather than walked by to the one great clock to whose dictum he made it practice to listen to last. Chattering the accustomed words, They say yes. They are all saying yes now. This one will say no. He bent his stiff old back and laid his ear to the unresponsive wood. But the time for no had passed. It was, yes, 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 now. And his straining ears took in the word. He appeared to shrink when he stood, and after a moment of anguished silence, 
broke forth into a low wail amid those lamentations one could hear. The time has come. Even the clock she loves best bids me speak. Oh, Arabella, Arabella. In his despair he had not noticed that the pendulum hung motionless, or that the hand stood at rest on the dial. If he had, he might have waited long enough to have seen the careful opening of the great clock's tall door and the stepping forth of the little lady who had played so deftly upon his superstition. He was wandering the corridors like a hopeless child when a gentle hand fell on his arm and a soft voice whispered in his ear, "'You have a story to tell. "'Will you tell it to me? "'It may save Miss Postlewaite's life.' "'Did he understand? "'Would he respond if he did? "'Or would the shock of her appeal restore him "'to a sense of the danger attending disloyalty?' For a moment she doubted the wisdom of this startling measure. Then she saw that he had passed the point of surprise, and that, stranger as she was, she had but to lead the way for him to follow, tell his story, and die. There was no light in the drawing-room when they entered, but old Mr. Dunbar did not seem to mind that. Indeed, he seemed to have lost all consciousness of present surroundings. He was even oblivious of her. This became quite evident when the lamp, in flaring up again in the hall, gave a momentary glimpse of his crouching, half-kneeling figure. In the pleading gesture of his trembling, outreached arms, Violet beheld an appeal, not to herself, but to some phantom of his imagination, and when he spoke, as he presently did, it was with the freedom of one whom speech is life's last boon, and the ear of the listener quite forgotten in the passion of confession long suppressed. "'She has never loved me,' he began, "'but I have always loved her. For me no other woman has existed. Though I was sixty-five years of age when I first saw her,' and had long given up the idea that there lived a woman who could sway me from my even life and fixed lines of duty. Sixty-five, and she a youthful bride. Was there ever such folly? Happily, I realized it from the first and piled ashes on my hidden flame. Perhaps that is why I adore her to this day and only give her over to reprobation because fate is stronger than my age, stronger even than my love. She is not a good woman, but I might have been a good man if I had never known the sin which drew a line of isolation around her and within which I and only I have stood with her in silent companionship. What was this sin, and in what did it have its beginning? I think its beginning was in the passion she had for her husband. It was not the everyday passion of her sex in this land of equable affections, but one of foreign fierceness, jealousy and insatiable demand. Yet he was a very ordinary man. I was once his tutor, and I know. She came to know it, too, when... But, but am I rushing on too fast? I, I have much to tell before I reach that point. From the first, I was in their confidence. Not that either he or she put me there, but that I lived with them and was always around and could not help seeing and hearing what went on between them. Why, he continued to want me in the house and at his table when I could no longer be of service to him, I have never known. Possibly habit explains it all. He was accustomed to my presence, and so was she. So accustomed they hardly noticed it. 
It happened one night when, after a little attempt at conversations, he threw down the book he had caught up and addressed her by name, said without a glance my way, and quite as if he were alone with her. Arabella, there is something I ought to tell you. I have tried to find the courage to do so many times before now, but I have always failed. Tonight, I must. And then he made his great disclosure, how, unknown to his friends and the world, he was a widower when he married her, and the father of a living child. With some women this might have passed with a moment of regret, and some possible contempt for his silence, but not so with her. She rose to her feet, I can see her yet, and for a moment stood facing him in the still, overpowering manner of one who feels the icy pang of hate enter where love has been. Never was a moment more charged. I could not breathe while it lasted, and when at last she spoke, it was with an, with an impetuosity of concentrated passion, hardly less dreadful than her silence had been. You, a father, a father already, she cried, all her sweetness swallowed up in unforgiving wrath. You whom I expect to make so happy with a child, I curse you and your brat. I... He strove to placate her to explain, but rage has no ears, and before I realized my own position, the scene had become openly temptuous. That her child should be second to another woman seemed to awaken demon instincts within her. When he ventured to hint that his little girl needed a mother's care, her irony bit like corroding acid. He became speechless before it, and had not a protest to raise when she declared that the secret he had kept so long and so successfully he must continue to keep to his dying day, that the child he had failed to own in his first wife's lifetime should remain disowned in hers, and, if possible, be forgotten. She should never give the girl a thought, nor acknowledge her in any way. She was fury embodied, but the fury was of that grand order which allures rather than repels. As I felt myself succumbing to its fascination and beheld how he was weakening under it even more perceptively than myself, I started from my chair and sought to glide away before I should hear him utter a fatal acquiescence. But the movement I made unfortunately drew her attention to me, and after an instant of silent contemplation of my distracted countenance, Frank said, as though he were the elder by the forty years which separated us, "'You have listened to Mrs. Postlewaite's wishes. You will respect them.' Of course. That was all. He knew, and she knew, that I was to be trusted. But neither of them has ever known why. A month later her child came, and was welcomed as though it was the first to bear his name. It was a boy. And the satisfaction was so great that I looked to see the old affection revive. But it had been cleft at the root and nothing could restore it to life. They loved the child. I have never seen evidence of greater parental passion than they both displayed, but there their feelings stopped. Towards each other they were cold. They did not even unite in worship of their treasure. They gloated over him and planned for him, but always apart. He was a child in a thousand and, as he developed the mother especially, nursed all her energies for the purpose of ensuring, for him, a future commiserate with his talent. Never a very conscientious woman, and alive to the advantage of wealth as demonstrated by the power wielded by her rich brother-in-law, she associated all the boy's prospects with money, great money, 
such money as Andrew had accumulated and now had at his disposal for his natural heirs. Hence came her great temptation, a temptation to which she yielded to the lasting trouble of us all. Of this I must now make confession, though it kills me to do so, and will soon kill her. The deeds of the past do not remain buried, however deep we dig their graves, but rise in an awful resurrection when we are old, old. Silence, then a tremulous renewal of his painful speech. Violet held her breath to listen. Possibly the doctor, hidden in the darkest corner of the room, did so also. I never knew how she became acquainted with the terms of her brother-in-law's will. He certainly never confided them in her, and as certainly the lawyer who drew up the document never did, but that she was well aware of its tenor is as positive a fact as that I am the most wretched man alive today. Otherwise, why the darksome deed into which she was betrayed when both the brothers lay dying among strangers of a dreadful accident? I was witness to that deed. I had accompanied her on her hurried ride, was at her side when she entered the inn where the two postal weights lay. I was always at her side in great joy or in great trouble, though she professed no affection for me and gave me but scanty thanks. During our ride she had been silent, and I had not disturbed that silence. I had much to think of. Should we find him living, or should we find him dead? If dead, would it sever the relations between us two? Would I ever ride with her again? When I was not dwelling on this theme, I was thinking of the parting look she gave her boy, a look which had some strange promise in it. What had that look meant, and why did my flesh creep and my mind hover between dread and a fearsome curiosity when I recalled it? Alas, there was reason for all these sensations, as I was soon to learn." We found the inn seething with terror, and in the facts worse than had been represented in the telegram. Her husband was dying. She had come just in time to witness the end. This they told her before she had taken off her veil. If they had wanted, if they had been given a full glimpse of her face, but it was hidden, and I could only judge of the nature of her emotions by the stern way in which she held herself. Take me to him, was the quiet command with which she met the disclosure, then before any of them could move. And his brother, Mr. Andrew Postlewaite. Is he fatally injured too? The reply was unequivocal. The doctors were uncertain which of the two would pass away first. You must remember that at this time I was ignorant of the rich man's will, and consequently of how the fate of a poor child of whom I had heard only one mention hung in the balance at that awful moment. But... In the breathlessness which seized Mrs. Postlewaite at this sentence of double death, I realized from my knowledge of her that something more than grief was at prey upon her impenetrable heart, and shuddered to the core of my being when she repeated in that voice which was so terrible because so expressionless. Take me to them. They were lying in one room, her husband nearest the door, the other in a small alcove some ten feet away. Both were unconscious. Both were surrounded by groups of frightened attendants who fell back as she approached. A doctor stood at the bed head of her husband. 
but as her eye met his, he stepped aside with a shake of a head and left the place empty for her. The action was significant. I saw that she understood what it meant, and with constricted heart watched her as she bent over the dying man and gazed into his wide open eyes already sightless and staring. Calculation was in her look and calculation only. And calculation or something equally unintelligible sent her next glance in the direction of his brother. What was in her mind? I could understand her indifference to Frank, even at the crisis of his fate, but not the interest she showed in Andrew. It was an absorbing one, altering her whole expression. I no longer knew her for my dear young madam, and the jealousy I had never felt towards Frank rose to frantic resentment in my breast as I beheld what very likely might be a tardy recognition of the other's well-known passion, forced into disclosure by the exigencies of the moment. Alarmed by the strength of my feelings, and fearing an equal disclosure on my own part, I sought for a refuge from all eyes and found it in a little balcony opening out at my right. Onto this balcony I stepped, and I found myself face to face with a starlit heaven. Had I only been content with my isolation and the splendor of the spectacle spread out before me. But no, I must look back upon that bed and the solitary woman standing beside it. I must watch the settling of her body into rigidity as a voice rose from beside the other postal weight, saying, It's a matter of minutes now. And then, and then the slow creeping of her hand to her husband's mouth, the outspreading of her palm across the livid lips, it steadily clinging there, smothering the feeble gasps of one already moribund until the quivering form grew still, and Frank Postlewaite lay dead before my eyes. I saw, and made no outcry, but she did, bringing the doctor back to her side with the startled exclamation, Dead! I thought he had an hour's life left in him, and now he has passed before his brother. I thought it hate, the murderous impulse of a woman who sees her enemy at her mercy and can no longer restrain the passion of her long-cherished antagonism. And while something within me rebelled at the act, I could not betray her. Though silence made a murderer of me too, I could not. Her spell was upon me as, in another instant, it was upon everyone else in the room. No suspicion of one so self-repressed in her sadness disturbed the universal sympathy. And encouraged by this blindness of the crowd, I vowed within myself never to reveal her secret. The man was dead, or as good as dead when she touched him. And now that her hate was expended, she could grow gentle and good. I knew the worthlessness of this hope as well as my misconception of her motive. When Frank's child by another wife returned to my memory, and Bella's sin stood exposed. But only to myself, I alone knew that the fortune now wholly hers, and in consequence her boys, had been won by a crime that if her hand had fallen in comfort on her husband's forehead instead of in pressure on his mouth, he would have outlived his brother long enough to have become owner of his millions, in which case a rightful portion would have been insured to his daughter, now left a penniless waif. The thought made my hair rise as the proceedings over. I faced her 
and made my first and last effort to rid my conscience of this new and intolerable burden. But the woman I had known and loved was no longer before me. The crown had touched her brows, and her charm, which had been mainly sexual up to this hour, had merged into an intellectual force with which few men's mentality could cope. Mine yielded at once to it. From the first instant I knew that a slavery of spirit as well as of heart was henceforth to be mine. She did not wait for me to speak. She had assumed the dictator's attitude at once. "'I know what you're thinking,' she said. "'And it is a subject you may dismiss at once from your mind. "'Mr. Postlewaite's child, by his first wife, is coming to live with us. "'I have expressed my wishes in this regard to my lawyer, "'and there is nothing left to be said. "'You, with your closed mouth and dependable nature, "'are to remain here as before "'and occupy the same position toward my boy "'that you did towards his father.' We shall move soon into a larger house, and the nature of our duties will be changed, and the scope greatly increased, but I know that you can be trusted to enlarge with them and meet every requirement I shall see fit to make. Do not try to express your thanks. I see them in your face. Did she, or just the last feeble struggle my conscience was making to break the bonds in which she held me, and win back my own respect. I shall never know, for she left me on completion of the speech, not to resume the subject, then or ever. But though I succumbed outwardly to her demands, I had not passed the point where inner conflict ends and peace begins. Her recognition of Helena and her reception into the family calmed me for a while, and gave me hope that all would yet be well. But I had never sounded the full bitterness of Madame's morbid heart, well as I thought I knew it. The hatred she had felt from the first for her husband's child ripened into frenzied dislike when she found her a living image of the mother whose picture she had come across among Frank's personal effects. To win a tear from those meek eyes instead of a smile to the sensitive lips was her daily play. She seemed to exult in the joy of impressing upon the girl by how little she had missed a great fortune, and I had often thought, much as I tried to keep my mind from all extravagant and unnecessary fancies, that half of the money she spent in beautifying this house and maintaining art industries and even great charitable institutions was spent with the base purpose of demonstrating to this child the power of immense wealth and in what ways she might expect to see her little brother expend the millions in which she had been denied all share. I was so sure of this that one night, while I was winding up the clocks with which Mrs. Postlewaite in her fondness for old timepieces has filled the house, I stopped to look at the little figure toiling so wearily upstairs to bed without a mother's kiss. There was an appeal in the small, wistful face which smote my hard old heart, and possibly a tear welled up in my own eye when I turned back to my duty. Was that why I felt the hand of providence upon me, when in my halt before the one clock to which any superstitious interest was attached, the great one at the foot of the stairs, I saw that it had stopped, and at the minute of all minutes in our wretched lives, four minutes past two, the hour, the minute in which Frank Postlewaite had gasped his last under the pressure of his wife's hand. I knew it, the exact minute, I mean, because providence meant that I should know it. There had been a clock on the mantelpiece of the hotel room where he and his brother had died, 
and I had seen her glance steal toward it at the instant she withdrew her palm from her husband's lips. The stare of that dial and the position of its hands had lived still in my mind as I believed it did in hers. Four minutes past two. How came our old timepieces here to stop at the exact moment on a day when duty was making its last demand upon me to remember Frank's unhappy child? There was no one to answer, but as I looked and looked, I felt the impulse of the moment strengthen into purpose to leave those hands undisturbed in the silent accusation. She might see, and, moved by the coincidence, tremble at her treatment of Helena. But if this happened, if she saw and trembled, she gave no sign. The works were started up by some other hand, and the incident passed. But it left me with an idea that the clock soon had a way of stopping, and always at that one instant of time. She was forced at length to notice it. And I remember on occasion when she stood stock still with her eyes on those hands and failed to find the banister with her hand, though she groped for it in her frantic need for support. But no command came from her to remove the worn-out piece, and soon its tricks and every lesser things were forgotten in the crushing calamity which befell us in the sickness and death of little Richard. Oh, those days and nights, and oh, the face of the mother when the doctors told her that the case was hopeless. I asked myself then, and I have asked myself a hundred times since, which of all the emotions I saw pictured there bit the deepest, and made the most lasting impression on her guilty heart. Was it remorse? If so, she showed no change in her attitude towards Helena, unless it was by an added bitterness. The sweetest looks and gentlest ways of Frank's young daughter could not win against a hate sharpened by disappointment. Useless for me to hope for it. Release from the remorse of years was not to come in that way. As I realized this, I grew desperate and resorted again to the old trick of stopping the clock at the fatal hour. This time, her guilty heart responded. She acknowledged the stab and let all her miseries appear. But how? In a way to wring my heart almost to madness and not benefit the child at all. She had her first stroke that night. I had made her a helpless invalid. That was eight years ago, and since then, what? Stagnation. She lived with her memories. And I with mine. Helena only had a right to hope, and hope perhaps she did, till... Is that the great clock talking? Listen, they all talk, but I heed only one. What does it say? Tell, tell, tell. Does it think I will be silent now when I come to my own guilt? That I will seek to hide my weakness when I could not hide her sin? Explain, it was Violet speaking, and her tone was stern in its command. Of what guilt do you speak? Not of guilt towards Helena, you pitied her too much. But I pitied my dear Madame Moore. It was that which affected me and drew me into crime against my will. Besides, I did not know, not at first, what was in the little bowl of curds and cream I carried to the girl each day. She had eaten them in her stepmother's room, and under her stepmother's eye as long as she had strength to pass from room to room, and how was I to guess that it was not wholesome? Because she failed in health from day to day? Was not my dear madam failing in health also? And was there poison in her cup? Innocent at that time, why am I not innocent now? Because, oh, I will tell it all, as though at the bar of God, I will tell all the secrets of that day. She was sitting with her hand 
trembling on the tray from which I had just lifted the bowl she had bid me carry to Helena. I had seen her so a hundred times before, but not with that just look in her eyes or just that air of desolation in her stony figure. Something made me speak, something made me ask if she were not quite so well as usual, and something made her reply with the dreadful truth that the doctor had given her just two months more to live. My fright and mad anguish stupefied me, for I was not prepared for this, no, not at all, and unconsciously I stared down at the ball I held, unable to breathe or move or even meet her look. As usual, she misinterpreted my emotion. Why do you stand like that? I heard her say in a tone of great irritation. And why do you stare into that bowl? Do you think I mean to leave that child to walk these halls after I am carried out of them forever? Do you measure my hate by such a petty yardstick as that? I tell you that I would rot above ground rather than enter it before she did. I had believed I knew this woman. But what soul ever knows another's? What soul ever knows itself? Bella, I cried, the first time I had ever presumed to address her so intimately. Would you poison the girl? And from sheer weakness my fingers lost their clutch, and the bowl fell to the floor, breaking into a dozen pieces. For a minute she stared down at these from her tray, and then she remarked very low and very quietly, "'Another bowl, Humphrey, and fresh curds from the kitchen. I will do the seasoning. The doses are too small to be skipped. You won't?' I had shaken my head. "'But you will.' It will not be the first time you've gone down the hall with this mixture. But that was before I knew, I began. And now you do. You will go just the same. Then, as I stood, hesitating, a thousand memories overwhelming me in an instant, she added in a voice to tear the heart. Do not make me hate the only being left in this world who understands and loves me. She was a helpless invalid, and I a broken man. But when the word love fell from her lips, I felt the blood start burning in my veins, and all the crust of habit and years of self-control loosened about my heart, and make me young again. What if her thoughts were dark and her wishes murderous? She was born to rule and sway men to her will, even to their own undoing. I wish I might kiss your hand, was what I murmured, gazing at her white fingers groping over her tray. You may, she answered, and hell became heaven to me for a brief instant. Then I lifted myself and went obediently about my task. But puppet though I was, I was not utterly without sympathy. When I entered Helena's room and saw how her startled eyes fell shrinkingly on the bowl I set down before her, my conscience leapt to life, and I could not help saying, "'Don't you like the curds, Helena? Your brother used to love them very much.' "'His were—' "'What, Helena?' "'What these are not,' she murmured. "'I stared at her terror-stricken. "'So she knew, and yet did not seize the bowl "'and empty it out the window. "'Instead, her hand moved slowly toward it "'and drew it into place before her. "'Yet I must eat,' she said, "'lifting her eyes to mine in a sort of patient despair, "'which yet was without accusation.' But my hand had instinctively gone to hers and grasped it. Why must you eat it? I asked. If, if you do not find it wholesome, why do you touch it? 
because my stepmother expects me to, she cried, and I have no other will than hers. When I was a little, little child, my father made me promise that if I ever came to live with her, I would obey her simplest wish, and I always have. I will not disappoint the trust he put in me, even if you die of it. I do not know whether I whispered these words or only thought them. She answered as though I had spoken. I'm not afraid to die. I'm more afraid to live. She may ask me to some day do something I feel to be wrong. When I fled down the hall that night, I heard one of the small clocks speak to me. Tell! It cried. Tell, tell, tell! I rushed away from it with beaded forehead and rising hair. Then another's note piped up. No! It droned. No, 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 no! I stopped and took heart. Disgrace the woman I loved on the brink of the grave? I who asked no other boon from heaven than to see her happy, gracious, and good. Impossible. I would obey the great clock's voice. The others were mere chatterboxes. But it has at last changed its tune for some reason, quite changed its tune. Now it says, yes, yes, instead of no. And in obeying it, I save Helena. But what of Bella? And oh. God, what of myself? A sigh, a groan, then a long, heavy silence, into which there finally broke the pealing of the various clocks striking the hour. When all were silent again, and Violet had drawn aside the portiere, it was to see the old man on his knees and between her and the thin streak of light entering from the hall, the figure of the doctor hastening to Helena's bedside. When the inducements needless to name, they finally persuaded the young girl to leave her unholy habitation. It was in the arms which had upheld her once before, and to a life which promised to compensate her for her twenty years of loneliness and unsatisfied longing. But a dark shadow yet remained which she must cross before reaching the sunshine. It lay at her stepmother's door. In the plans made for Helena's release, Mrs. Postlewaite's consent had not been obtained, nor was she supposed to be acquainted with the doctor's intention toward the child whose death she was hourly waiting. It was therefore with an astonishment, bordering on awe, that on their way downstairs they saw the door of her room open, and herself standing alone and upright on the threshold, she who had not been seen take a step in years. In the wonder of this miracle of sudden, restored power, the little procession stopped. The doctor with his hand upon the rail, the lover with his burden clasped yet more protectingly to his breast, that the little speech awaited them could be seen from the force and the fury of the gaze which the indomitable woman bent upon lax and half-unconscious figure she beheld thus sheltered and conveyed. Having but one arrow left in her exhausted quiver, she launched it straight at the innocent breast which had never harbored against her a defiant thought. Ingrate! was the word she hurled in a voice from which all its seductive music had gone forever. Where are you going? Are they carrying you alive to your grave? A moan from Helena's pale lips, then silence. She had fainted at that barbed attack. But there was one there who dared to answer for her, and he spoke relentlessly. It was the man who loved her. No, madam, we are carrying her to safety. You must know what I mean by that. Let her go quietly, and you may die in peace. Otherwise, she interrupted him with a loud call, startling into life the echoes of the haunted hall. Humphrey! Come to me, Humphrey! But no Humphrey appeared. Another call, louder and more peremptory than before. Humphrey! I say, Humphrey! But the answer was the same. Silence and only silence. And the horror of this grew. The doctor spoke. 
Mr. Humphrey Dunbar's ears are closed to all earthly summons. He died last night at the very hour he said he would, four minutes after two. Four minutes after two? It came from her lips in a whisper, but with a revelation of her broken heart and life. Four minutes after two? And defiant to the last, her head rose, and for an instant, for a mere breath of time, they saw her as she looked in her prime, regal in form, attitude, and expression. Then the will which had sustained her through much faltered and succumbed, and with a final reiteration of the words, four minutes after two, she broke into a rattling laugh and fell back into the arms of her old nurse. And below, one clock struck the hour, then another, but not the big one at the foot of the stairs. That stood silent, with its hands pointing to the hour and minute of Frank Postlewaite's hastened death. The House of Clocks, Part Two, recorded by Deborah Maddock. Section 10 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 10. Problem 8. The Doctor, His Wife, and the Clock. Part 1. Violet had gone to her room. She had a task before her. That afternoon a packet had been left at the door, which, from a certain letter scribbled in one corner, she knew to be from her employer. The contents of that packet must be read, and she had made herself comfortable with the intention of setting to work at once. But ten o'clock struck, and then eleven, before she could bring herself to give any attention to the manuscript awaiting her perusal. In her present mood, a quiet sitting by the fire, with her eyes upon the changeful flame, was preferable to the study of any affair her employer might send her. Yet, because she was conscious of the duty she thus openly neglected, she sat crouched over her desk with her hand on the mysterious packet, the string of which, however, she made no effort to loosen. What was she thinking of? We are not alone in our curiosity on this subject. Her brother Arthur, coming unperceived into the room, gives tokens of a similar interest. Never before had he seen her so oblivious to an approaching step, and after a momentary contemplation of her absorbed figure, so girlishly sweet and yet so deeply intent, he advances to her side, and peering earnestly into her face, observes with a seriousness quite unusual to him, Puss, you are looking worried. Not like yourself at all. I've noticed it for some time. What's up? Getting tired of the business? No, not altogether. That is, it's not that, if it's anything. I'm not sure that it's anything. I— She had turned back to her desk and was pushing about the various articles with which it was plentifully bespread. But this did not hide the flush which had crept into her cheeks, and even dyed the snowy whiteness of her neck. Arthur's astonishment at this evidence of emotion was very great. But he said nothing, only watched her still more closely, as with a light laugh she regained her self-possession, and with the practical air of a philosopher, uttered this trite remark. "'Everyone has his sober moments. I was only thinking—' "'Of some new case?' "'Not exactly.' The words came softly, but with a touch of mingled humor and gravity which made Arthur stare again. "'See here, puss,' he cried. His tone had changed. I've just come up from the den. Father and I have had a row, a beastly row. A row? You and father? Oh, Arthur, I don't like that. Don't quarrel with father. Don't, don't. Some day he and I may have a serious difference about what I am doing. Don't let him feel that he has lost us all. That's all right, Puss, but I've got to think of you a bit. I can't see you spoil in all your good times with these police horrors and not do something to help. Tomorrow I begin life as a salesman in Clark and Stebbins. 
the salary is not great but every little helps and i don't dislike the business but father does he had rather see me loafing about town setting the fashions for fellows as idle as myself than soil my hands with handling merchandise that's why we quarrelled but don't worry your name didn't come up or or you know whose he hasn't an idea of why i want to work there violet there two soft arms were around his neck and violet was letting her heart out in a succession of sisterly kisses oh arthur you good good boy together we'll soon make up the amount and then then what a sweet soft look robbed her face of its piquancy but gave it an aspect of indescribable beauty quite new to arthur's eyes tapping his lips with a thoughtful forefinger he asked who was that sombre looking chap i saw bowing to you as we came out of church last sunday she awoke from her dreamy state with an astonishing quickness he surely you remember him have you forgotten that evening in massachusetts the grotto and oh it's up john is it yes i remember him he's fond of church isn't he that is when he's in new york her lips took a roguish curve then a very serious one but she made no answer i have noticed that he's always in his seat and always looking your way that's very odd of him she declared her dimples coming and going in a most bewildering fashion i can't imagine why he should do that nor i retorted arthur with a smile but he's human i suppose only do be careful violet a man so melancholy will need a deal of cheering he was gone before he had fully finished this daring remark and violet left again with her thoughts lost her glowing color but not her preoccupation the hand which lay upon the packet already alluded to did not move for many minutes and when she roused at last to the demands of her employer it was with a start and a guilty look at the small gold clock ticking out its inexorable reminder he will want an answer the first thing in the morning she complained to herself and opening the packet she took out first a letter then a mass of typewritten manuscript she began with the letter which was as characteristic of the writer as all the others she had had from his hand as witness you probably remember the hasbrook murder or perhaps you don't it being one of a time previous to your interest in such matters but whether you remember it or not i beg you to read the accompanying summary with due care and attention to business when you have well mastered it with all its details please communicate with me in any manner most convenient to yourself for i shall have a word to say to you then which you may be glad to hear if as you have lately intimated you need to earn but one or two more substantial rewards in order to cry halt to the pursuit for which you have proved yourself so well qualified the story in deference to yourself as a young and much preoccupied woman has been written in a way to interest though the work of an everyday police detective you will find it in no lack of mystery or romance and if at the end you perceive that it runs as such cases frequently do up against a perfectly blank wall you must remember that openings can be made in walls and that the loosening of one weak stone from its appointed place sometimes leads to the downfall of all so much for the letter laying it aside with a shrug of her expressive shoulders violet took up the manuscript let us take it up too it runs thus on the seventeenth of july nineteen blank a tragedy of no little interest occurred in one of the residences of the colonnade in lafayette place mr hasbrook a well-known and highly respected citizen was attacked in his room by an unknown assailant and shot dead before assistance could reach him his murderer escaped and the problem offered to the police was how to identify this person who by some happy chance or by the exercise of the most remarkable forethought had left no traces behind him or any clue by which he could be followed the details of the investigation which ended so unsatisfactorily are here given by the men sent from headquarters at the first alarm when some time after midnight on the date above mentioned i reached lafayette place i found the block lighted from end to end groups of excited men and women peered from the open doorways and mingled their shadows with those of the huge pillars which adorned the front of this picturesque block of dwellings the house in which the crime had been committed was near the centre of the row and long before i reached it i had learned from more than one source that the alarm was first given to the street by a woman's shriek 
and secondly by the shouts of an old man-servant who had appeared in a half-dressed condition at the window of mr hasbrook's room crying murder murder but when i had crossed the threshold i was astonished at the paucity of the facts to be gleaned from the inmates themselves the old servant who was the first to talk had only this account of the crime to give the family which consisted of mr hasbrook his wife and three servants had retired for the night at the usual hour and under the usual auspices at eleven o'clock the lights were all extinguished and the whole house asleep with the possible exception of mr hasbrook himself who being a man of large business responsibilities was frequently troubled with insomnia suddenly mrs hasbrook woke with a start had she dreamed the words that were ringing in her ears or had they been actually uttered in her hearing they were short sharp words full of terror and menace and she had nearly satisfied herself that she had imagined them when there came from somewhere near the door a sound she neither understood nor could interpret but which filled her with inexplicable terror and made her afraid to breathe or even to stretch forth her hand towards her husband whom she supposed to be sleeping at her side at length another strange sound which she was sure was not due to her imagination drove her to make an attempt to rouse him when she was horrified to find that she was alone in bed and her husband nowhere within reach filled now with something more than nervous apprehension she flung herself to the floor and tried to penetrate with frenzied glances the surrounding darkness but the blinds and shutters having both been carefully closed by mr hasbrook before retiring she found this impossible and she was about to sink in terror to the floor when she heard a low gasp on the other side of the room followed by a suppressed cry god what have i done the voice was a strange one but before the fear aroused by this fact could culminate in a shriek of dismay she caught the sound of retreating footsteps and eagerly listening she heard them descend the stairs and depart by the front door had she known what had occurred had there been no doubt in her mind as to what lay in the darkness on the other side of the room it is likely that at the noise caused by the closing front door she would have made at once for the balcony that opened out from the window before which she was standing and taken one look at the flying figure below but her uncertainty as to what lay hidden from her by the darkness chained her feet to the floor and there is no knowing when she would have moved if a carriage had not at that moment passed down astor place bringing with it a sense of companionship which broke the spell holding her and gave her strength to light the gas which was in ready reach of her hand as the sudden blaze illuminated the room revealing in a burst the old familiar walls and well-known pieces of furniture she felt for a moment as if released from some heavy nightmare and restored to the common experiences of life but in another instant her former dread returned and she found herself quaking at the prospect of passing around the foot of the bed into that part of the room which was as yet hidden from her eyes but the desperation which comes with great crises finally drove her from retreat and creeping slowly forward she cast one glance at the floor before her when she found her worst fears realized by the sight of the dead body of her husband lying prone before the open doorway with a bullet hole in his forehead her first impulse was to shriek but by a powerful exercise of will she checked herself and ringing frantically for the servants who slept on the top floor of the house flew to the nearest window and endeavored to open it but the shutters had been bolted so securely by mr hasbrook in his endeavor to shut out all light and sound that by the time she had succeeded in unfastening them all trace of the flying murderer had vanished from the street sick with grief and terror she stepped back into the room just as the three frightened servants descended the stairs as they appeared in the open doorway she pointed at her husband's inanimate form and then as if suddenly realizing in its full force the calamity which had befallen her she threw up her arms and sank forward to the floor in a dead faint the two women rushed to her assistance but the old butler bounding over the bed sprang to the window and shrieked his alarm to the street in the interim that followed mrs hasbrook was revived and the master's body lay decently on the bed but no pursuit was made nor any inquiries started likely to assist me in establishing the identity of the assailant indeed every one both in the house and out seemed dazed by the unexpected catastrophe and as no one had any suspicions to offer as to the probable murderer i had a difficult task before me i began in the usual way by inspecting the scene of the murder 
I found nothing in the room, or in the condition of the body itself, which added an iota to the knowledge already obtained. That Mr. Hasbrook had been in bed, that he had risen upon hearing a noise, and that he had been shot before reaching the door, were self-evident facts. But there was nothing to guide me further. The very simplicity of the circumstances caused a dearth of clues, which made the difficulty of procedure as great as any I had ever encountered. My search through the hall and down the stairs elicited nothing, and an investigation of the bolts and bars by which the house was secured assured me that the assassin had either entered by the front door, or had already been secreted in the house when it was locked up for the night. "'I shall have to trouble Mrs. Hasbrook for a short interview,' I hereupon announced to the trembling old servant, who had followed me like a dog about the house. He made no demur, and in a few minutes I was ushered into the presence of the newly made widow, who sat quite alone in a large chamber in the rear. As I crossed the threshold she looked up, and I encountered a good, plain face without the shadow of guile in it. "'Madam,' said I, "'I have not come to disturb you. I will ask two or three questions only, and then leave you to your grief. I am told that some words came from the assassin before he delivered his fatal shot. Did you hear these distinctly enough to tell me what they were?' "'I was sound asleep,' said she and dreamt, as I thought, that a fierce, strange voice cried somewhere to some one, "'Ha! Ah, you did not expect me!' But I dare not say that these words were really uttered to my husband, for he was not the man to call forth hate, and only a man in the extremity of passion could address such an exclamation in such a tone as rings in my memory in connection with the fatal shot which woke me. "'But that shot was not the work of a friend,' I argued if as these words seem to prove the assassin had some other motive than plunder in his assault then your husband had an enemy though you never suspected it impossible was her steady reply uttered in the most convincing tone the man who shot him was a common burglar and frightened at having been betrayed into murder fled without looking for booty i am sure i heard him cry out in terror and remorse god what have i done was that before you left the side of the bed Yes, I did not move from my place till I heard the front door close. I was paralyzed by fear and dread. Are you in the habit of trusting to the security of a latch lock only in the fastening of a front door at night? I am told that the big key was not in the lock, and that the bolt at the bottom of the door was not drawn. The bolt at the bottom of the door is never drawn. Mr. Hasbrook was so good a man that he never mistrusted anyone. That is why the big lock was not fastened. The key, not working well, he took it some days ago to the locksmith, and when the latter failed to return it, he laughed, and said he thought no one would ever think of meddling with his front door. "'Is there more than one night key to your house?' I now asked. She shook her head. "'And when did Mr. Hasbrook last use his?' "'Tonight, when he came home from prayer meeting,' she answered, and burst into tears." Her grief was so real and her loss so recent that I hesitated to afflict her by further questions. So returning to the scene of the tragedy, I stepped out upon the balcony which ran in front. Soft voices instantly struck my ears. The neighbors on either side were grouped in front of their own windows and were exchanging the remarks natural under the circumstances. I paused, as in duty bound, and listened but I heard nothing worth recording and would have instantly re-entered the house if I had not been impressed by the appearance of a very graceful woman who stood at my right. She was clinging to her husband, who was gazing at one of the pillars before him in a strange, fixed way, which astonished me, till he attempted to move, and then I saw that he was blind. I remembered that there lived in this row a blind doctor, equally celebrated for his skill and for his uncommon personal attractions, and greatly interested not only by his infliction, but in the sympathy evinced by his young and affectionate wife, I stood still, till I heard her say in the soft and appealing tones of love, "'Come in, Constant. You have heavy duties for to-morrow, and you should get a few hours' rest, if possible.' He came from the shadow of the pillar, and for one moment I saw his face with the lamplight shining full upon it. It was as regular a feature as a sculptured Adonis, and it was as white. "'Sleep!' he repeated, in the measured tones of deep but suppressed feeling, "'Sleep! With murder on the other side of the wall!' And he stretched out his arms in a dazed way that insensibly accentuated the horror I myself felt of the crime which had so lately taken place in the room behind me. She, noting the movement, took one of the groping hands in her own, and drew him gently towards her. "'This way,' she urged. 
and guiding him into the house, she closed the window and drew down the shades. I have no excuse to offer for my curiosity, but the interest excited in me by this totally irrelevant episode was so great that I did not leave the neighborhood till I had learned something of this remarkable couple. The story told me was very simple. Dr. Zabriskie had not been born blind, but had become so after a grievous illness which had stricken him down soon after he received his diploma. Instead of succumbing to an affliction which would have daunted most men, he expressed his intention of practicing his profession, and soon became so successful in it that he found no difficulty in establishing himself in one of the best-paying quarters of the city. Indeed, his intuition seemed to have developed in a remarkable degree after the loss of his sight, and he seldom, if ever, made a mistake in diagnosis. Considering this fact, and the personal attractions which gave him distinction, it was no wonder that he soon became a popular physician whose presence was a benefaction, and whose word law. He had been engaged to be married at the time of his illness, and when he learned what was likely to be its result, had offered to release the young lady from all obligations to him. But she would not be released, and they were married. This had taken place some five years previous to Mr. Hasbrook's death, three of which had been spent by them in Lafayette Place so much for the beautiful woman next door there being absolutely no clue to the assailant of mr hasbrook i naturally looked forward to the inquest for some evidence upon which to work but there seemed to be no underlying facts to this tragedy the most careful study into the habits and conduct of the deceased brought nothing to light save his general beneficence and rectitude nor was there in his history or in that of his wife any secret or hidden obligation calculated to provoke any such act of revenge as murder Mrs. Hasbrook surmised that the intruder was simply a burglar, and that she had rather imagined than heard the words which pointed to the shooting as a deed of vengeance, soon gained general credence. But though the police worked long and arduously in this new direction, their efforts were without fruit, and the case bids fair to remain an unsolvable mystery. That was all. As Violet dropped the last page from her hand, she recalled a certain phrase in her employer's letter if at the end you come upon a perfectly blank wall well she had come upon this wall did he expect her to make an opening in it or had he already done so himself and was merely testing her much vaunted discernment piqued by the thought she carefully reread the manuscript and when she had again reached its uncompromising end she gave herself up to a few minutes of concentrated thought then taking a sheet of paper from the rack before her she wrote upon it a single sentence and folding the sheet put it in an envelope which she left unaddressed this done she went to bed and slept like the child she really was at an early hour the next morning she entered her employer's office acknowledging with a nod his somewhat ceremonious bow she handed him the envelope in which she had enclosed that one mysterious sentence he took it with a smile opened it offhand glanced at what she had written and flushed a vivid red you are a brick he was going to say but changed the last word to one more in keeping with her character and appearance look here i expected this from you and so prepared myself taking out a similar piece of paper from his own pocket-book he laid it down beside hers on the desk before him it also held a single sentence and barring a slight difference of expression the one was the counterpart of the other the one loose stone he murmured seen and noted by both why not he asked then as she glanced expectantly his way he earnestly added together we may be able to do something the reward offered by mrs hasbrook for the detection of the murderer was a very large one she is a woman of means i have never heard of its being withdrawn then it never has been was violet's emphatic conclusion her dimples enforcing the statement as only such dimples can but what do you want of me in an affair of this kind something more than to help you locate the one possible clue to further enlightenment you would not have mentioned the big reward just for that perhaps not there is a sequel to the story i sent you i have written it out with my own hand take it home and read it at your leisure when you see into what an unhappy maze my own inquiries have led me possibly you will be glad to assist me in clearing up a situation which is inflicting great suffering on one whom you will be the first to pity if so a line mentioning the fact will be much appreciated by me and disregarding her startled look and the impetuous shaking of her head he bowed her out with something more than his accustomed suavity 
but also with a seriousness which affected her in spite of herself and effectually held back the protest it was in her heart to make she was glad of this when she read his story but later on however it is not for me to intrude violet or violet's feelings into an affair which she is so anxious to forget i shall therefore from this moment on leave her as completely out of this tale of crime and retribution as is possible and to keep a full record of her work when she is necessary to the story you will see her again meanwhile read with her this relation of her employer's unhappy attempt to pursue an investigation so openly dropped by the police you will perceive from its general style and the accentuation put upon the human side of this sombre story a likeness to the former manuscript which may prove to you as it certainly did to violet to whose consideration she was indebted for the readableness of the policeman's report which in all probability had been a simple statement of facts but there i am speaking of violet again to prevent a further mischance of this nature i will introduce at once the above mentioned account two no man in all new york was ever more interested than myself in the hasbrook affair when it was the one and only topic of interest at a period when news was unusually scarce but together with many such inexplicable mysteries it had passed almost completely from my mind when it was forcibly brought back one day by a walk i took through lafayette place at sight of the long row of uniform buildings with their pillared fronts and connecting balconies every detail of the crime which had filled the papers at the time with innumerable conjectures returned to me with extraordinary clearness and before i knew it i found myself standing stock still in the middle of the block with my eye raised to the housebrook house and my ears or rather my inner consciousness for no one spoke i am sure ringing with the question which whether the echo of some old thought or the expression of a new one so affected me by the promise it held of some hitherto unsuspected clue that i hesitated whether to push this new inquiry then and there by an attempted interview with mrs housebrook or to wait till i had given it the thought which such a stirring of dead bones rightfully demanded you know what the question was i shall have communicated it to you if you have not already guessed it before perusing these lines who uttered the scream which gave the first alarm of mr housebrook's violent death i was in a state of such excitement as i walked away for i listened to my better judgment as to the inadvisability of my disturbing mrs housebrook with these new inquiries that the perspiration stood out on my forehead the testimony she had given at the inquest recurred to me and i remembered as distinctly as if she were then speaking that she had expressly stated that she did not scream when confronted by the sight of her husband's dead body but someone had screamed and that very loudly who was it then one of the maids startled by the sudden summons from below or someone else some involuntary witness of the crime whose testimony had been suppressed at the inquest by fear or influence the possibility of having come upon a clue even at this late day so fired my ambition that i took the first opportunity of revisiting lafayette place choosing such persons as i thought most open to my questions i learned that there were many who could testify to having heard a woman's shrill scream on that memorable night just prior to the alarm given by old cyrus but no one who could tell from whose lips it had come one fact however was immediately settled it had not been the result of the servant woman's fears both of the girls were positive that they had uttered no sound nor had they themselves heard any till cyrus rushed to the window with his wild cries as the scream by whomever given was uttered before they descended the stairs i was convinced by these assurances that it had issued from one of the front windows and not from the rear of the house where their own rooms lay could it be that it had sprung from the adjoining dwelling and that i remembered who had lived there and was for ringing the bell at once but missing the doctor's sign i made inquiries and found that he had moved from the block however a doctor is soon found and in less than fifteen minutes i was at the door of his new home where i asked not for him but for mrs zabriskie it required some courage to do this for i had taken particular notice of the doctor's wife at the inquest and her beauty at that time had worn such an aspect of mingled sweetness and dignity that i hesitated to encounter it under any circumstances likely to disturb its pure serenity but a clue once grasped cannot be lightly set aside by a true detective and it would have taken more than a woman's frowns to stop me at this point however it was not with frowns that she received me 
but with a display of emotion for which I was even less prepared. I had sent up my card, and I saw it trembling in her hand as she entered the room. As she neared me, she glanced at it, and with a show of gentle indifference, which did not in the least disguise her extreme anxiety, she courteously remarked, "'Your name is an unfamiliar one to me. But you told my maid that your business was one of extreme importance, and so I have consented to see you. What can an agent from a private detective office have to say to me?' Startled by this evidence of the existence of some hidden skeleton in her own closet, I made an immediate attempt to reassure her. "'Nothing which concerns you personally,' said I. "'I simply wish to ask you a question in regard to a small matter connected with Mr. Hasbrook's violent death in Lafayette Place a couple of years ago. You were living in the adjoining house at the time, I believe, and it has occurred to me that you might on that account be able to settle a point which has never been fully cleared up.' Instead of showing the relief I expected, her pallor increased, and her fine eyes, which had been fixed curiously upon me, sank in confusion to the floor. Great heaven, thought I, she looks as if at one more word from me she would fall at my feet in a faint. What is this I have stumbled upon? I do not see how you can have any question to ask me on that subject, she began, with an effort at composure which for some reason disturbed me more than her previous open display of fear. "'Yet if you have,' she continued, with a rapid change of manner that touched my heart in spite of myself, "'I shall, of course, do my best to answer you.' There are women whose sweetest tones and most charming smiles only serve to awaken distrust in men of my calling, but Mrs. Zabriskie was not of this number. Her face was beautiful, but it was also candid in its expression, and beneath the agitation which palpably disturbed her, I was sure there lurked nothing either wicked or false. Yet I held fast by the clue which I had grasped, as it were, in the dark, and without knowing whither I was tending, and much less whither I was leading her, I proceeded to say, The question which I presume to put to you as the next-door neighbor of Mr. Hasbrook is this. Who was the woman who on the night of that gentleman's assassination screamed out so loudly that the whole neighborhood heard her? The gasp she gave answered my question in a way she little realized, and struck as I was by the impalpable links that had led me to the threshold of this hitherto unsolvable mystery, I was about to press my advantage and ask another question, when she quickly started forward and laid her hand on my lips. Astonished, I looked at her inquiringly, but her head was turned aside, and her eyes, fixed upon the door, showed the greatest anxiety. Instantly I realized what she feared. Her husband was entering the house, and she dreaded lest his ears should catch a word of our conversation. Not knowing what was in her mind, and unable to realize the importance of that moment to her, I yet listened to the advance of her blind husband with an almost painful interest. Would he enter the room where we were, or would he pass immediately to his office in the rear? She seemed to wonder, too, and almost held her breath as he neared the door, paused, and stood in the open doorway with his ear turned towards us. As for myself, I remained perfectly still, gazing at his face in mingled surprise and apprehension. For besides its beauty, which was of a marked order, as I have already observed, it had a touching expression which irresistibly aroused both pity and interest in the spectator. This may have been the result of his affliction, or it may have sprung from some deeper cause. But whatever its source, this look in his face produced a strong impression upon me, and interested me at once in his personality. Would he enter, or would he pass on? Her look of silent appeal showed me in which direction her wishes lay, but while I answered her glance by complete silence, I was conscious, in some indistinct way, that the business I had undertaken would be better furthered by his entrance. The blind have often been said to possess a sixth sense in place of the one they have lost. Though I am sure we made no noise, I soon perceived that he was aware of our presence. Stepping hastily forward, he said, in the high and vibrating tone of restrained passion, "'Zulma, are you there?' For a moment I thought she did not mean to answer, but knowing doubtless from experience the impossibility of deceiving him, she answered with a cheerful assent, dropping her hand as she did so from before my lips. He heard the slight rustle which accompanied the movement, and a look I found it hard to comprehend flashed over his features, altering his expression so completely that he seemed another man. "'You have someone with you,' he declared, advancing another step, 
but with none of the uncertainty which usually accompanies the movement of the blind. "'Some dear friend,' he went on, with an almost sarcastic emphasis and a forced smile that had little of gaiety in it. The agitated and distressed blush which answered him could have but one interpretation. He suspected that her hand had been clasped in mine, and she perceived his thought and knew that I perceived it also. Drawing herself up, she moved towards him, saying in a sweet, womanly tone, "'It is no friend, Constant, not even an acquaintance. The person whom I now present to you is a representative from some detective agency. He is here upon a trivial errand which will soon be finished, when I will join you in the office.' I knew she was but taking a choice between two evils, that she would have saved her husband the knowledge of my calling as well as of my presence in the house, if her self-respect would have allowed it. But neither she nor I anticipated the effect which this introduction of myself in my business capacity would produce upon him. "'A detective,' he repeated, staring with his sightless eyes, as if, in his eagerness to see, he half hoped his lost sense would return." He can have no trivial errand here. He has been sent by God himself to— Let me speak for you, hastily interposed his wife, springing to his side and clasping his arm with a fervor that was equally expressive of appeal and command. Then turning to me, she explained, Since Mr. Housebrook's unaccountable death, my husband has been laboring under an hallucination, which I have only to mention, for you to recognize its perfect absurdity. He thinks— Oh, do not look like that, Constant. You know it is an hallucination, which must vanish the moment we drag it into broad daylight, that he, he, the best man in all the world, was himself the assailant of Mr. Hasbrook. Good God! I say nothing of the impossibility of this being so, she went on in a fever of expostulation. He is blind, and could not have delivered such a shot, even if he had desired to. Besides, he had no weapon. But the inconsistency of the thing speaks for itself, and should assure him that his mind is unbalanced, and that he is merely suffering from a shock that was greater than we realized. He is a physician, and has had many such instances in his own practice. Why, he was very much attached to Mr. Hasbrook. They were the best of friends, and though he insists that he killed him, he cannot give any reason for the deed. At these words the doctor's face grew stern and he spoke like an automaton, repeating some fearful lesson. I killed him. I went to his room and deliberately shot him. I had nothing against him, and my remorse is extreme. Arrest me and let me pay the penalty of my crime. It is the only way in which I can obtain peace. Shocked beyond all power of self-control by this repetition of what she evidently considered the unhappy ravings of a madman, she let go his arm and turned upon me in a frenzy convince him she cried convince him by your questions that he never could have done this fearful thing end of problem eight part one